I feel like almost we should straight up, this one should just be a dissection of Kick's brain. And then the next one should just be all of the, the Catholic, the parents, yeah, okay. the Billy. Because you need Now the f- that we have the basis of her personality, yeah. we'll go into. And you need the full story. Because we can't really talk about any of that yeah. yet. Yeah. The new guy. Yeah, because I think that shows a lot as well. It's pretty, pretty. She like fully goes. Yeah. It's like she tells you what was happening the whole time by finally committing to it. Yeah. We need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode 7. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Jackie may be more complicated, but Kick is the most confusing. It's funny because Cassie did not want to cover Kick or Pat or Jean at all. She's like, they're the most boring, the whatever, the most self-centered. Especially Kick. Yeah, especially Kick. And now we have two episodes fully dedicated to her. And she wasn't even going to do like five minutes. If you're going to go there, just go. Like you have to fully tell the story from start to finish. There's a lot there. There's a lot. Well, the same thing happened with Rosemary. I thought that she was just going to have one episode, tie it up nicely. But to do the whole narrative and for the story to mean something. Yeah, it doesn't have as much impact or it's not as powerful if you don't know all of the context and exactly what happened before. And you don't feel, and if you feel like you don't know the person, intimately. then you don't care. Yeah. Right. I'm getting more comfortable with just taking the time to tell everyone's story. Yeah. And it's so true though, because I look back on photos, especially the Jackie and Jack photos. Yes. Because I have seen them all before when we did Jackie. Mm-hmm. But when I was looking at those photos before, I was really just looking at Jackie and thinking about who she is and all the context behind that. And Which when I saw Jack, I had no had only scratch the surface. I think that after Jackie's episode this season, mm-hmm. I feel like you'll have more empathy for Jackie. Yeah. And and we kind of get more into her own individual decisions rather mm-hmm. than like her and Lee and growing up and da da da. And their toxic relationship. And right. And how she was as a sister. Uh huh. Yeah. It's Just like Jackie. Jackie by herself. Yeah. And that's a different way to look at things. Mm-hmm. So you were looking at the photos and you like knew Jackie and her sister. You didn't know Jackie individually and you also didn't know Jack. Right. So I did not care at all about Jack. I was like barely even looking at him in the photos, had no emotion or feeling towards him at all, could not care less. And now I'm like, oh my, there's just so much meaning and so much depth when I'm looking at them and their faces. And because you feel like you know that person now, yes. like, that's a friend. But yeah, but when I look at older photos of him, like him and Jackie after they've been married for a while, I still, there's that a yes. little bit of distance where we don't know him. Yes. And he looks so different than he did as a kid because his illness and the stress and being president and just took like, <gasps> I think I told you. The illness and the stress and the steroids, the steroids it all took such a toll on him that he aged a lot and he gets like puffy. And anyways, uh-huh. his face looks totally different. And I, I can tell I have less empathy and less care for that JFK, that Jack, than we don't I do know him for the yet. younger one. Yes. Isn't yeah. that so weird? And I hate, I almost hate that because it's like, okay, well, I should have so much empathy and care about every human, no matter who they are. But it's just a weird thing about storytelling because you don't know, like you didn't care about the Kennedys or know okay. about them at all. And now your entire life has changed because of their story and they don't even know that you exist. For sure. That is wild. That is it's just a wild. weird thing to think about. I feel like last season we didn't take enough time to actually get to know people on this level. Yeah. So you couldn't care on this level. For sure. I felt like the Disney brothers, I was so emotionally tied to and compared to the Kennedys, no, (laughs) not at all. I know. Which is so- I feel like I still don't know Walt really. Yeah. It sucks though, because I feel like there's not going to be this amount of information on very many people. Like the queen, maybe. Yeah, that I definitely think the queen. But like intimate thoughts and letters and stuff like that. I can't figure out is if it's going to be as raw information. That's what I'm saying. Because it's so curated and- Protected. Yeah, like the Kennedys- 
weren't anyone when this was happening and the and royals also are, have they were always o- been someone and that well they were okay with being messy the royals are not yeah yeah maybe with Harry and Meghan will get more of that raw information. I still don't think. I think she is very calculated and curated. She's not being completely, totally raw and honest. Okay. I haven't researched but it, It's at more all. casual, I think, but it's not less filtered. So, yeah, it is just such a cool, unique experience with the Kennedys. And that is why they can have such impact. And yep. I feel like that's one of the biggest lessons. The more vulnerable, the more open and honest you are, and you let people see your yeah your ske- the skeletons in your closet. That is what gives you the power to influence and wow. help yeah. others. I don't feel like the royal <laughs> like. What are they? You know what I mean? Yeah, they're definitely. They are definitely not going to change my life. I can tell you that right now. They might change my life in certain no. areas, <laughs> but not to this extent to where yeah. I literally view the world and view myself in a completely different way. Yeah, it's total. I I. Went into the Kennedys thinking, oh, this is going to be something really dramatic and headliney that we can post on TikTok about, and it'll be fun. I had no idea that it was going to be this. Welcome to today's KFM. Joe's shiniest penny. His swan that was better than all the other <laughs> His golden goose. <gasps> Kathleen. They actually did have such a unique relationship, Joe Sr. and Kathleen. I felt like I knew Joe like the back of my hand previous to doing the two episodes of Butt Kick. I know. But there's a whole other side of him, like a tenderness. And he was a, extra soft with her. Yes. Joe in general is more sensitive and soft and tender and loving even to the boys than I had thought he was going to be before For affecting sure. their family. And it comes out the most with Kick. You can see it a lot with Rosemary too, but it's um, more so I need to take care. Like protective. Yes. Yes. And then with Kick, it's more just enjoying. Yes. And Kick, I thought, was going to be a lot more emotional than she actually was. She, more than anyone, is, well, no, that's not true. Rose, I think, beats her with the practicality. composure and the coldness and the sterile personality. But- Kick also can be so cold. Mm -hmm. And it's confusing with her more so because she does tend to show a lot more emotion, like enjoyment. Rose, yeah, Rose presented as very stoic and Mm -hmm. you almost got that she put it on. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a very like public display. And it was a choice. And Kick was more so a public display of like, I'm enjoying, I'm letting myself be free. I'm letting myself go, be but mess. I just don't have it. Whatever it is, the I'm depth. not composing it. I just don't feel that. Yes. Yeah. It seems almost more like sociopathic <laughs> with Kathleen. For a minute, I was literally like, what? There's is she some- antisocial personality disorder? Yes. <laughs> is there something to that? And I don't think so. I think it was more her personality mixed with her upbringing that created that coldness and that manipulative. Let's talk about that. Conniving side of her. Because we've decided that Kick almost for sure is in Enneagram 7. And we also believe that Jack was in Enneagram 7. And we also think that she was probably an Enneagram 7 wing 8. Yeah, and we think Jack was probably an Enneagram 7 wing 6. Right. 7 wing 6 is the entertainer? No. Yeah. 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 And then the 7 wing 8 is the realist. Right there. Right. Yep. Wing. Right there. Ah. Right there. Bullet pointed. Highlighted. Underlined. Looped in with the other freaking thing. <laughs> the So it is, yeah, the entertainer and the realist. Wow, I'm actually right. Shaka. I'm silent. (laughs) Kick for sure had this. What she wanted and what was actually reality. Yeah. And so I think that she made a lot of decisions from the viewpoint of the realist. Uh Uh-huh. But it's kind of like a battle, like a dance between both at different times. Like sometimes she, you can almost see her fantasizing about what could be and Could I get everything that I ever wanted? And can I be the happiest person ever? But it feels like the whole time she never believes that that's actually a possibility. There's 
this separation or like a wall. We're just going to indulge for a minute and fully read the Enneagram 7 type description on the Enneagram Institute because it's like, not only Kathleen's Enneagram yeah. number, we think, but it's also Jack's. And those are two of our main characters. The reason that we always talk about the Enneagram is because it has helped us in our own lives know ourselves and understand ourselves and our family members so much better. And then if you know a general description or like a general gist um, of each number, basically, if you just know the motivating, like their basic motivation and their basic fear of each number, you can kind of figure out what people are and then immediately you unlock all of this other information like about their motivations and the way they see the world and all this stuff. And it just like, it's a very, very quick way to just put understand yourself, someone. Yeah. To put yourself in their shoes instantly and, to and know, know someone better, to know where they're coming from, because we can all be saying the same thing. But if our intentions or why we're saying that is different, it like completely changes your perspective. The reason that we're talking about it with Kick is because her story is so freaking hard to understand and so confusing because her actions don't like they're very her actions contradicting and the things she says, all this stuff is so hard to understand. So this is going to help us kind of parse through it all and organize it and see the battle in her mind, her mind because she is so torn so often in the letters that she's sending to Jack and Joe Jr. and her friends and her parents, the decisions that she makes, and the next episode, her like major, major life decisions don't make sense to me based on the person that she is in this first episode yep. about her. We took so much time trying to figure out what in the crud Kick was doing and why and how she's so similar and to Jack yet so freaking different. This entire time, I'm just trying to figure out who she is. Who in the world is Kathleen Kick Kennedy? I don't, I could not figure that out for weeks. Because Jack, he fronts a little bit better. Like maybe he has a little bit more of a solid identity yes. in a way. And obviously a much more solid purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of covers up the fact that he doesn't know who he is deep down inside. With Kick, it's like immediately apparent that she's so confused, she's so torn. Even before we started researching her in depth, we knew that there was something weird happening with who she was, the yep. decisions that she made. She's just all over the place. It's, so there's a distance in her and around her. So because we pinpointed, okay, she's for sure this, uh, it unlocked all of the understanding and all of the answers that we were looking for. So let's talk about it. If you have not taken the Enneagram test, let us know. DM us on Instagram and I'll shoot you the free version of the quiz. And then you'll have to let us know what number you are. Technically, the most infallible way to diagnose yourself is to just read through the descriptions of all nine numbers and and look at yourself and be introspective. But that is hard to do sometimes. Yeah, so if, to if actually a test will help you and you, yeah, you can just be honest with those answers, you can get at least a couple of options that you can read through and figure out, okay, this sounds exactly like me. And when you find your number, you it will, will be, read through the description and you will be like, oh my gosh, this, someone is reading inside my head right now. Probably the reason it helped us so much specifically is because my little sister and Cassie, which is my older sister, they're both Enneagram fours and they are both very much emotional identity. Everything is like existential. And I am very much not that personality type. So we were constantly misunderstanding each other. And it, it's obvious that we have good intentions. Yeah. But Cassie, when when we were fighting, Cassie would literally be like, there's no way that you can think that or say that and not mean this, which is the only thing that I could even possibly think would be the explanation or the reason or the motivation behind me this. saying something. And I would tell her that absolutely not. Didn't even cross my mind. This is what I was thinking. And she just wouldn't believe me. And then now that we have like receipts, okay, see, this is my motivation. It just like all makes sense. It like opens up a whole different way of, well, it's just like the, what we were talking about before. When you don't know someone, when you fully don't know someone, you can't understand them. It's like hard to care because you don't get it. You're and once you it, get it, yeah. it's so hard to not have empathy or sympathy. Because mm -hmm. you just understand. And yeah. for some reason, 
humans are so stupid that we have to figure out that we have to understand it. It has to make sense to us. Uh huh. And well, it helps greatly. Yeah. But I mean, that's like the number one thing in psychology is that the human race is just trying to make sense of things and yeah. we need meaning and all of that kind of stuff. So it's like on a very deep level. But needless to say, it helps a freaking ton. And if you struggle in your relationships, arguing or you just want to get better because we can all be better, do better. It's also super fun. Yeah, it is. It's <laughs> like, like a game. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you if you want something like fun to do with your family members mm-hmm. or with your friends or your spouse, your significant other, it's super fun like to do a date where mm-hmm. you like order takeout and just like read through your each of your things. And then also on the Enneagram Institute, they have pairings. So they'll say like, this is what a relationship between a seven and a one looks like. This is what a relationship between a five and a four looks like. Mm-hmm. And those are also so spot on yeah, with trouble spots, uh, strengths, uh-huh, what each of them bring to the table, what they pull out in each other, their favorite things to do together. And it's like someone is reading. So like, where are the cameras? Yeah, this is the Truman Show. <laughs> Okay, so a seven, which is what we think Jack and Kick both are. On the Enneagram Institute, it says a type seven is the enthusiast, the busy variety seeking type, spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. Mm. And boy, are Jack and Kick scattered. So in stress, they move towards an Enneagram type one, which is what I am. And that is the perfectionist and the advocate. And when they are in growth, they move to a type five, which is what Cassie's husband is. That is the investigator. And they are very, very, very much in their heads, kind of trudging through all the details and the mechanisms of things constantly. And they can kind of escape, like they can, it can be a great thing. And it can also be something a little bit dangerous where they get lost in their own world and in like a fantasy or a a detached reality within themselves. The seven is the base personality that both Jack and Kick have. So this is that description. Sevens are extroverted, optimistic, versatile, and spontaneous, playful, high-spirited, and practical. They can also misapply their many talents, becoming overextended, scattered, and undisciplined, which people say constantly about Jack, that he's undisciplined, that he's all over the place, that he looks a mess. They constantly seek new and exciting experiences, but can become distracted and exhausted by staying on the go, which is literally why Jack never freaking even remotely got healthier because like physically because he was always on the go. They typically have problems with impatience and impulsiveness. At their best, they focus their talents on worthwhile goals, becoming appreciative, joyous, and satisfied. So this right here, these bullet points I'm about to read, their basic fear, desire, and their wings, I think give a really good explanation of the motivations of the decisions that Kick makes this episode and the next episode as well, but also with Jack and kind of just about their differences as well. Helps you figure out who they are. Who am I talking about? So their basic fear is of being deprived and in pain. And their basic desire is to be satisfied and content, to have their needs fulfilled. I see this so much and I want to talk more about it next episode because I think that Kick's major main decisions in life were all based in, okay, the world is not perfect. So how am I going to make sure that I get my needs met? What are my main needs and how do I make sure... That I make sure that those are uh-huh. that those needs are met. Is it, yeah, she did make decisions with a basis of fear and mistrust in others. And so because of that, I feel like she was extra manipulative and controlling in a very like internal way, like in her own head. She didn't present that way. I think she was like really good at kind of hiding it. Well, we see with the John White relationship mm-hmm. that she's in her head, trying to kind of craft their relationship to be what she wants it to be. And he's like not a factor at all. Like he he doesn't have any autonomy in her head. She is the puppet master. Yes. And he's largely unaware of it until you kind of see little glimpses of her being honest with him or like she decides that she likes to be hugged. Yeah, like it's a decision. She has to consciously 
think about and she's torn. Do I like being hugged? Do I not? Most people, it would just be a natural thing. Like you either like physical affection uh-huh. or physical touch is not okay with you. Well, and then most people would just accept a hug. If the other person wants to give me a hug and I'm comfortable with that, I will accept the, the hug. But she is trying to manipulate and orchestrate his behavior to fulfill what she is wanting him mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. So it's like she's not even allowing him to be present in the relationship. It's just her orchestrating what I need out of this relationship. And I think she kind of does that to Billy too. Like she she does know that Billy loves her. Are we sure she wasn't a five? <laughs> no, she knows that Billy doesn't love, or she knows, does she go there in stress or in growth? Growth. She goes to a five and like, should we reread? <laughs> but the five description with kick in mind. I feel like she's, yeah, we should. But they're because both five in the thinking in, triad. But if a five in growth is it? No, they can't be because I'm a I'm a seven in growth. But maybe in stress she goes to a five, or she goes to a seven. <gasps> that actually might be true. Go look. Uh, also, well, I'll just take this opportunity to say, if you have a different opinion or a different perspective, message us because we are not saying that we're right about everything. We're just saying these are our thoughts. And also we are going to be talking about the Catholic church quite a bit because that is a huge, huge narrative in Kick's story. So if you are Catholic and you have insight that we don't have because we are not Catholic, message us because we can always do a little corrections corner or a little recap. Uh Bingo, baby. Bethany thinks she's a fun. A five goes to seven in stress and an eight in growth. I don't know. I can't freaking tell. But the thing is, it's confusing because she could be a base seven and then in growth go to a five and be acting in those behaviors. In that and then she could be a base five and be in stress all the time and be going to a seven and having the same behaviors. But it's from different, it's coming from a different place. A so different that's motivation. why you have to look at the second level of it and be looking at the circumstances, what's going on in her life. Is she in stress or is she in growth? I feel like kick is like the fantasy conniving part. But she's, but she's not the like want to possess knowledge to understand the environment, to have everything figured out as a way of defending the self from threats from the environment. No. Poor eating and sleeping habits due to minimizing needs, neglecting hygiene and nutrition, lack of physical activity psychotropic drugs from- she's not a f- basic five she's i agree a she is seven. A seven i feel like she wants to be fed she she at her core is a seven so it's going to be invaluable to have this basis of who she is so that when we talk about all the events in her life all the decisions in her life next episode we're going to be able to figure out we're going to be able to see clearly what is happening And looking at it through this lens or uh, through the lens of understanding who she is at her core makes her decision so much more fascinating too. Because without that, you looking at her decisions the whole time, you're just like, what in the world? Like, what is she doing? It doesn't make sense. I can't have an opinion because I don't really know what's going on. Yeah. What is this? What does that mean? And then when you, upon further instruction, she is absolutely for sure just a seven investigation instruction. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she's a seven in growth often I think uh she really was trying to like figure life out figure out who she was she was kind of trying to figure out who she was apart from just being a Kennedy and mm-hmm. apart from her family and so yeah her key motivation for sure to maintain freedom and happiness to avoid missing out that is boop, tie a bow on it walk away that's it that is who she was to keep themselves excited and occupied. She could not let an opportunity slip through her fingers. She if she felt couldn't. like it was worthwhile. Yes. Or if it was enviable. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because it was like Lee. Like at her at your core, would you have been happier with your family? Yes. But it was like the potential that the other life could give you that it might That you might be better. miss out on something better. And something that everybody else definitely would want. And it's at your fingertips. Okay, so back to type sevens because we just reconfirmed that yeah. she's a type seven. So keep motiv- it would be hard for someone to message me and actually convince me that she's not. Like I am very, very confident that she is a seven. I agree. We would have to have a lot of new information about her that would change things. That would sway us. So the key motivations 
for Enneagram 7s. They want to maintain their freedom and happiness, to avoid missing out on worthwhile experiences, to keep themselves excited and occupied, to avoid and discharge pain. And if you didn't absorb that, rewind because that tells you everything you need to know. All the little decisions, all the big decisions. She is sometimes torn because of her religion, her environment, her upbringing, the parenting that she received, her sibling's attitude, the events and life circumstances all play into this and can kind of fog over her core motivation, but it is always there. And that's what makes it a little bit more confusing is because their life was obviously extreme and there were so many added factors, more than average, more than the average person. But in every situation, every instance, she this this is the thing that never disappears, that never mm-hmm. goes away. Other things kind of pop into her mind. She's like trying to figure out should I be doing is? this? Do my parents want me to do that? What are the consequences if I choose this? What's right? Can it really be that way? Can I have everything or do I have to choose? But when she is forced to choose at the end of the day, this never is not present. Yes. Okay. So if you're looking at the Enneagram Institute website and you're following along with us, just go to the types of an overview and that's what I'm going to read next. We've named this personality type the enthusiast because sevens are enthusiastic about almost everything that catches their attention. Boy, if that ain't Jack and kick. (laughs) They approach life with curiosity, optimism, and a sense of adventure. They're bold and vivacious, pursuing what they want in life with a cheerful determination, which you see that determination come out a ton with Jack when he's starting his political career. But also even before that, with his rivalry with Joe Jr., he's so determined to compete with Mm -hmm. Joe Jr. in football. At the expense of his body. Yeah. And with football, yeah, going to war, literally everything. Which is always confusing to me because it's like, oh, if you just want to have fun, how are you that determined and that strict on yourself? But if it's for the end goal of your own satisfaction. Yeah, adventure mm -hmm. and Uh, experiences. Yeah. Okay. So then it goes on to talk about how they have a high ability to learn new skills and have a wide range in curiosity and ability to learn quickly, but that that can also create problems for them because they're able to pick up many different skills with relative ease. It becomes more difficult for them to decide what to do with themselves, which is freaking kick. She can never freaking decide. She's the whole time torn. And maybe that's why she took such a liking to the British culture and everything because she was so easily able to assimilate and kind of change herself and pick up on what is British, what is British culture, what is British society, what kind of and behavior it was new and or fun and exactly. with her for her. And so that was intoxicating. She found a new interest or a new hobby almost. A new thing to play with. And a new, yeah, a new thing to throw herself into. But it also says, as a result, they also don't always value their abilities as they would if they had to struggle to gain them, Mm. which she reminded me a lot of Teddy at the beginning of getting to know Kick because there is that arrogance, that privilege, that narcissistic, almost shallowness. Yeah. But it's to me, it looked like it was all due to privilege. She almost has a very visible shallowness and an ungratefulness that seems like it's a result of just growing up spoiled. Like she didn't have the opportunity to fully form a deep identity or grow as a person. Right. I was thinking it was because obviously her upbringing, they're rich. Joe Sr. is obsessed with Kathleen. She's the basically the oldest girl. So the one that's closest to both of her parents the one that Rose pours a ton into other than Rosemary. And it's not that she is just enough no matter what she does and she doesn't need to perform. It's the ground you walk on is holy. It sparkles because you have been here. Like you are so amazing. It's not just you're enough. You're especially special. She walks into Lady Astor's freaking village and she's like, I belong here. Obviously, look at me. Like (laughs) clearly I was born to be here. I'm probably better than any of you guys even. Yeah. And I was thinking that it was like a a, a very spoiled or narcissistic or like an overly confident Uh place. But 
which it is like she's able to be that way because she's so confident and because of her upbringing, obviously. But the it's motivation also just is her personality. Her sights are set on having fun. She's not worried about what other people are thinking, what other people are doing. <laughs> yeah. She's worried about it's herself, about her experience. Yes, that is crazy. I have never experienced that in my life. I'm like, what do you think about me? <laughs> The root of their problem is common to all of the types of the thinking center. They are out of touch with the inner guidance and support of their essential nature, which I don't really know what that means, but like their inner I think that like your gut instinct, like whenever I am trying to decide something, I... Cassie's not even a part of the gut triad, so I don't know what she's talking about. No, I'm not, but I (laughs) I am. am, Well, I'm the the emotional, but is it heart? Okay. So... I think that the thinking triads... I think that I think... Struggle. Because making a to-do list... Or not a to-do list. Making a pros and cons list and evaluating a situation and like what is the better decision to make... Logically. Does not actually tell you what you should do. Correct. Because that doesn't tell you what you want. It doesn't tell you what the best option is for you and what you're going to feel the most Mm -hmm. good about long term or that you actually at the end of your life are going to look back and be like that was what I wanted. It doesn't tell you what you care about. Exactly. And I think that they get so caught up going around and around and around and around thinking through things because the more they search, the more they can't find it's what the, they're actually looking for because what they're actually looking for is themselves. Yeah. And, it's, and they're not on a list. Uh-huh. It's information overload for sure. They're, they're, you can constantly find more information, new ideas, new thoughts, but new text. You're, what you're searching for though, yeah, is like you said, it's not out there. You're, it's not information you're going to gather. It is inner work that you just have to figure out within yourself. Who am I? What do I care about? What are my priorities? And being honest about that when it doesn't make sense. Yes. It's fine but that it's what irrational. I want may not be, number one, the best thing. Number two, what other people would want to do. Number three, what society says is the best, most successful version of my options. The truth is, this is how I feel and this is what I want. Right. And then you start there. That doesn't mean that you have to make that decision. Uh -uh. But being honest about that gives you so much to work with and a place to start. As with fives and sixes, this creates a deep anxiety in sevens. They don't feel that they know what to do or how to make choices that will be beneficial to themselves and others. Because they're detached. Mm -hmm. They are not on the list. It's like they are thinking about the list that is not really reflective of them. And so it's, there's a separation. So that, I feel like that causes anxiety because you feel like, where am I? Who am I? Why can't I figure this out? Why Uh can't, what's the disconnect? There's like an unrest that you feel unsettled about. Even when you do come to the conclusion on paper, oh, this is the right decision on paper. Uh It still doesn't feel right because it's not, there's a disconnect. Yes. It's a detachment. And both Jack and Kick have a severe detachment issue. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Severe. And it's not as recognizable in their younger years, but as time goes on Mm -hmm. and they start making more and more of their own decisions, adult decisions, and just have more freedom in exploring areas. Holy crap. You're like you, there is something, there is a detachment that is not normal. That is extreme. And that's when they start to realize it. Cause as a kid, you just feel like, okay, well, everyone feels this way. Or like, you don't really even know You just know, yeah, oh, I feel this way-ish, but you're not even conscious that you feel that way. Just looking back, you know, oh, that's how I felt as a kid. And I also think that you just think, once I grow up, I'll figure it out and it'll just make sense and come come together. Sevens cope with this anxiety in two ways. First, they try to keep their minds busy all of the time, which Jack, even more so than Kick, was kept himself busy to such an unhealthy extent. It's wild. And his family obviously fed into that. But you look at how ill he was 24 7. He never slowed yeah. down, not even for a second. Well, he got sick and had to leave Princeton. So he went to Harvard. Like, he keeps himself busy mentally and, like, more so physically. Kick keeps herself busy with engagements and events and fun activities and going out. Yeah, and she indulged she, herself a lot more than Jack did, actually, like, thinking about it. Like, Jack did sexually more so, yes. a lot more than Kick. He was so promiscuous, and Kick really wasn't, especially up until this point. 
Yes. But she did, yeah, much more with like friends and going out and parties. And mm-hmm. Jack was like, I would rather be at home with a book yes. with my close friends. Because, well, that just wasn't fun to him. And it was fun to kick. A really good example of kick being in her head like crazy and keeping herself busy when she should just be resting and having fun is when she's on that army ship or is the Navy... I think it's, I don't know know. when she's on the Queen Mary and it's like full of soldiers and they're going over to England from America and she is in the Red Cross. It's the time period when she's like complaining about the girls staying up late until 130. And we really don't flatter ourselves with the compliments from the men because the ratio is so off balance. (laughs) It's not really a compliment. So while she's on that ship, she is doing her daily exercise and like walking up and down the ship. It's like 40 feet and she's just like pacing, pacing, pacing back and forth. And while she's doing this, she's like, quote unquote, exercising and keeping herself busy. But she's just running a rat wheel in her mind over and over and over thinking about all the things. And she's going from America back to England and she's she knows she's going to be able to see Billy. She's going to have that opportunity to rekindle that relationship. And she's trying to figure out who she is, what she should do. And I don't even know if she's trying to think, figure out what she wants as much as the consequences of each decision almost. Yeah, like, like what, is- what should I do and what's going to happen? And she kind of is playing out each scenario, like fantasy in her brain. If I pick this path, what is that going to give me? Which one is more painful and which one is more fun? What is it going to look like? What are other people going to think about it? But at the end of the day, even though she thinks, what is my family going to think about it? What will the Dukes of Devonshire think about all of this? Uh, She always makes her decision based on her personal experience and what it's going to do for her. Yeah. Which is not inherently bad. It's just clear. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That is a clear example where she could be resting. She could be enjoying these other girls. Be present. I don't know why she wouldn't want to have fun with these other girls, but she's just trying to keep herself as busy as possible in her own mind. Second, sevens cope with the loss of essential guidance by using the trial and error method. They try everything to make sure they know what is best. And Oh my gosh. This is why originally I was so confused by kick because I'm like, what is she doing? She's uh, some of the things that she said, some of the things that she did, they're just so all over the map and it doesn't seem like it should be coming from the same human. I'm going to try hugging. Yes. I've decided after contemplation and trial and error, I do like hugging, but only if. Yeah. And I'm going to be so, so flirty, but you can only treat me like I'm your sister. This is exactly why she would not leave Peter Grace alone. This Wait, is why? freaking why. This is why. I don't even know. Because though you're like, I don't understand why she won't leave him alone. She knows she doesn't freaking like him. No, she doesn't. She is trial uh, and error. This. Trial and error. Trial and error. Trial and error. She tried it again. She's like, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. But on Let me paper, this looks again. good. On paper, this would yes. work. So I don't understand why it wouldn't work. She tries it. Error, error, error. She's like thinking it to death. But then she doesn't feel arrived or fulfilled with her decision at the end. So she has to physically try it again and just see. Because, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, It's like or the whole trial just... and error thing. Uh, read that thing again. Okay. Sevens cope with the loss of essential guidance by using the trial and error method. They try everything to make sure they know what is best. On a very deep level... Sevens do not feel that they can find what they really want in life. It's like your whole like flawed, I'm flawed, my identity, I'm different. No one understands. They're like, I'll never arrive. I'll never get there. I'll never figure it out. I can't. Yeah. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Be at rest. Like she's just going to be. Always searching. Always looking. Never content. Never arrived. Because she feels she's like that's back impossible. in America. So she's like, well, that wasn't dead. That didn't die. I have to go visit it again. She also was getting something from him because she has a a deep need for stimulation, for excitement, for fun, fun. connection. So she wants to go out and like go out on the New York City scene with him. So she's getting that. But I think she chose him again because she wasn't sure that it was dead. I was thinking she 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 knew it was dead and she literally doesn't give a crap what he thinks. And she's fine with him being half invested in her again. But she was like, no, maybe I can give him or he can. Maybe give- I do want this. Yeah, maybe he can give me what I do, what I need. 
I was just distracted. If I can't have Billy, then maybe now knowing I can't have Billy, maybe this time it'll work. Maybe this time I'll be fulfilled by him. And then she realized he was just the same. She's, yes, see, she was hopeful. She was, it wasn't a, no, I know that you're not good. And I know that I don't want you. And I'm still going to use you anyways, because I I have nothing else right now. It wasn't that She wasn't just evil. using him. She yeah. was literally trying it again. That's crazy. See, that's where perspective comes in because I thought she was, I thought she knew for sure I'm using him completely. I already know that this doesn't work. I already know that I don't actually like him or that I don't, don't actually want him. But I want to have fun and that's fine. If he's stringing along, whatever. Yeah, yeah I thought that she was putting completely. her own needs above, like just carnivorous. You know yes, what I mean? like not empathetic at all. Didn't care. Just will use and abuse anyone as long as it will give her pleasure. But she was literally trying it again, trying it again and investigating and fr- trying to figure it out and thinking it over again and again. It's just exhausting. Like, I'm exhausted just like looking at it. Ugh. You made your decision. Walk away. And maybe too, because of the way that Kick walked away from Peter Grace, she didn't get yeah, that there closure. Was a lack of closure. There was still like that reinforced the fact that, oh, maybe that will work. Maybe that would have worked. Maybe that would have been fun. And I just didn't give it a fair shot. So Mm -hmm. I'll try it again. But it's like, if you were so gung-ho and ready to walk away at the first sight of any promise of anything better. With no goodbye, no letter, no even thought that like maybe I shouldn't. But I think after reading this type description that it was more so a lack of ability or willingness or even knowledge that she should be putting herself in other people's shoes because I think because she was so lost and confused herself and she was so young know which way was up out of a place of desperation and survival when you're so under the water yourself and you're so lost you don't unless you are just super mature and or have somebody else outside pointing that out to you yeah helping you see that you're not looking around. She was almost like a celebrity, like the, like child no celebrities. One no you one, no. Yes. So uh-huh. you just don't even. You're like you're so emotionally stunted. Well, the one person your who was telling stunted. her no, she didn't trust their opinion. Who? Her mom. Oh, yeah, the one person. Even when she did look around to the people that were in her life to see kind of like how they were acting, and if she even attempted to give herself a personal check of like, okay, wait, am I doing the right thing here? She looks at Rose and Rose is so cold and she didn't want Rose's life point blank period. Correct. As much as she might think like, oh, that is what I should be doing. She didn't want to do that. So she Mm -hmm. wasn't going to do that long term. Correct. And it's not like Rose had a healthy point of view either or a balance that she could mimic or emulate or look to she knew her mom wasn't happy and that is what she wanted to be. Yes. So, so it's why like, okay, would well, she then I'm not going to look to her. Way. I'm not going to get advice from the lady that's miserable. Yeah. So I think it's less that she doesn't have empathy and more so doesn't even have the opportunity to have empathy because she never even took the time to look outside herself and look at what other people might be feeling. So didn't look at what Peter Grace might feel when she lets him, if, because she was so lost and confused. She didn't know I'm not going to be with Peter Grace long-term. I'm just trying him on for size just to Uh make sure. Yes. On a very deep level, someone's don't feel that they can find what they really want in life. They therefore tend to try everything and ultimately may even resort to anything as a substitute for what they're looking for a.k.a. Peter Grace was a substitute for Billy, which was a substitute for someone in the future. If I can't have what will really satisfy me, I'll enjoy myself anyway. I'll have all kinds of experiences. That way I will not feel bad about not getting what I really want. That is, yes, absolutely kick. But oh my gosh, if that does not sum Jack up. If I can't get what I really want, a fulfilled life, a Long life, a long life, die at an old age, my father's affection and devotion. I'll at least enjoy myself with what I have. If I'm permanently second string, if I'm permanently fighting with a shadow that blah, 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 whatever. Shadow boxing in a match, he will never win and forever enshrined in his father's heart. (laughs) We can revisit that later on Jack's episode. Yeah. This next part, you are definitely going to want to screenshot because 
it is so freaking applicable for next episode, but you don't have all the information yet, so we can't freaking talk about it. But anyways, you will want to re-reference it. It's the paragraph that starts with furthermore. (laughs) Furthermore, as sevens speed up their pursuit of whatever seems to offer freedom and satisfaction, they tend to make worse choices. Oh. And they are less able to be satisfied because everything is experienced indirectly through the dense filter of their fast-paced mental activity. Okay, they're never content and the because choices that they, they make, that they're discon- sacrificing like they're sacrificing their actual happiness long term for what they think might possibly have the potential to make them happy at the moment. She's so desperate all the time to get a quick fix to feel good. And there is that lack of consequence on a deep level because she feels like, well, I'm never going to get what I want. So I'm not really sacrificing. Oh. I'm not sacrificing my perfect life. I'm not sacrificing actual happiness because that doesn't exist. Mm. So the consequences are less quote unquote painful for her because she doesn't believe there is a life outside of it. Yeah. A hope. Hmm, Which yeah. the difference between Jack and Kick, I feel like. Because she really did create a prison loop on repeat of torture, torment, torment, torment. And just a lacking of deep connection, a lacking of satisfaction and contentment. Like she just is not content and that breeds such uneasiness and anxiety, just searching 24-7. A shallowness, a, a lack of connection to anyone. Because if you're always like, there's got to be something better around the corner, so I'm not going to get attached. You can't feel deep emotions towards people because and that is literally you're one Jack. foot out the door the whole time. That is literally Jack. Jack, to an even further extent, I feel like thought that there was no... that He that, would never that have he, that real... Yes, that didn't exist. So he was so okay with surface level, quick. I'm not even going to try to even think about getting married or finding my soulmate or being super happy and in love because that doesn't exist. Wow. So and and I think that they were so tempted to believe that because it's obviously something that they're susceptible to in their personality, but they were tempted to believe it because they never saw anyone have that. Mm-hmm. And everything that they ever saw their whole life wasn't what they wanted. It like backed up their initial It gave them evidence that that's true, that does mm-hmm. not exist. Mm-hmm. And so they really, really based a lot of their life and their their decisions on that belief that that's all there is. There isn't any more. <laughs> and um I hope someone got that reference. <laughs> there isn't any more. A lot of people also see Jack as was he a narcissist? Was he da da da? Did he have a personality disorder? Was but he manic? I think d- just the personality and the mind that he had was With? was the fire, and then the lighter fluid was the experience that he'd had in his life Mm -hmm. and what he thought was possible and he just didn't go deeper because it's like the whole rosemary thing why would i look for something that doesn't exist i don't know that there's a problem so why go looking for one yeah i don't know that there's pure happiness out there so why go looking for it and then on top of that how busy they always are and then on top of that how busy they always want to be with their personality and so they're just like in survival mode 24 7 and they never get out of it comfortable for them The discomfort is comfortable for their personality. Because, and that's all they've ever known, really. Yeah. There's actually some from Jack. The reason we're referencing Jack so much is because they have the same Enneagram type, but we're also about to dive straight into his individual story. So a lot of this is going to be very prevalent in the upcoming episodes. And even just next episode in Kick's end of her story, Jack and his mentality and kind of where he was at with this whole emotional journey uh, comes up because- They were similar in that and they talked about it. Mm -hmm. But oh my gosh, the constantly longing and thinking that doesn't exist. I will never have that. Or it doesn't exist for me. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that they thought real love doesn't exist. I think they just thought it doesn't exist for me. I'm incapable of it. I feel like Kick more so than Jack believed that possibly I can have a hint She was more so like actually looking for it and constantly wandering and never- Like a happily ever after. Maybe because of her gender, maybe because Rose was the one that was- Raised her more so to believe that like there is a- Fulfillment. A commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, something that will bring A landing place, a resting place. And Joe was the one who wasn't in Jack. That's literally all Jack saw was Joe's uh, modeling- 
yeah. of what a good father or of what a good adult is. And so he literally never, ever, ever even had an inkling of a thought that like literally, and that makes me even more convinced that the, the only reason he married Jackie oh, was for sure. For, like, sure, did he like ish love her? Yeah, ish. But we're going to talk about that. Okay, sorry. But there's some quotes from Jack, but it, you're right. He, Kick was at least still on the search and never would let herself l- like rest or land. But Jack straight up wasn't even looking. He's just wandering. But maybe he was, too. He like stopped. Sur- he didn't even search. Yeah, you know? he never even searched. He never because searched. Because I think he knew he was going to die young. And so he was like, K- Kathleen was thinking, oh, I have the next 80 years to figure this out. I have the next 80 years to maybe bump into oh, someone shoot, you're right. who will be the one for me. Lana, I heard it too. I know Nini. Come on. I didn't. There's a car door. A car door slammed. You're right. And we kind of brought that up a little bit, but that mortality nugget and piece that Jack had that nobody else did really did make a lot of difference with him. Lana, come here now. <laughs> Lana, come on. A good girl that you came. Can you sit it down? <laughs> She's just so, like, you can literally understand everything that she's saying through her facial expressions. It's crazy. Um, and you've got, like, an eye patch, Nini, because your mommy needs to cut that hair. Okay. You think this makes a somewhat coherent sense, I feel like? Yeah, it definitely does, I think. I'm sad that, like, we know so much that they don't know. I know. That is the, the struggle. That was the freaking struggle with Rosemary, and that's why we felt like, oh, we have we have nothing for episode three, and then we had two KFMs for that. <laughs> Because we know Jack in the future. We know the next episode. I know that. There's you know so much the juicy, things. juicy stuff coming up. Like all of the juicy stuff. It's going to be so fun talking about psychology. This is why this is really, really good that we're setting this up right now and kind of getting a basis for who is Jack? Who is Kick? What is an Enneagram 7? Because you need to know how to filter these things because these things are freaking weird. Weird. Like just absolutely unwell. Like are you so, so brainwashed? Really wrong with you. Yes. It there's so many things that you have to have this piece in order to even make remote sense of it. Like and to humanize the actions because right. I feel like you that's how people that is how you villainize someone. Yes. You take away their personality, you take away their perspective, you take away any remote motivation of like why would you do that? Nuance. But literally rosemary. Yes. You make people villains because you're not you're putting like, into context the the got, humanness of them. Yeah. So finally, on the positive side, sevens are extremely optimistic people, exuberant and upbeat. Well, if that ain't true, they are endowed with abundant vitality and a desire to fully participate in their lives each day, which was this quote quote. Jack literally Jack, said that. Literally word for all word. All I'm said trying that. to do. Wait, do we freaking have we said that yet? Just remember that because that is exactly what Jack said he was trying to do was live every day like it was his last. That's basically, I mean, the Jack gist. was YOLO. Yeah. That is this charm, this charisma, that this magical aura that everybody can't describe. It's literally that they were present in every moment that when you were talking to them, that Life was the best it up. place that you could be. That they could be, that you could be, was right here. And this was the most exhilarating opportunity. Everything, they were fully in every moment, yet they weren't. Because long term, they knew this is only for a moment. I'm going to relish and enjoy all the surface level of this moment. Isn't that quote in this episode? Uh, the, The war... They were all act, like having fun, laughing. You would have no idea yes. that it was such a dark time, uh-huh. but nobody really knew the Kennedys. It's literally that. Yes. It was that day-to-day fun they vitality. They were fully, fully, fully present in every moment, yet in... When you look deeper. Yes. It's like... There was an underlying... surface level, there's all this intoxicating excitement and... Optimism and... and uh, what is it when you feel like you're never going to die? You're untouchable, like... Yeah, they felt... They were like infinite, you know? Yeah. The moment... All the moments were infinite, but they never, like... They didn't need the longevity, plant though. themselves it, it, in any long-term commitment with any, any person, any... But the weirdest career. part is that they... It, they were freaking right. Like they didn't have the longevity. None I of them know. lived. But like, did that breed that? 
Probably. Because oh, they were fully balls to the wall extreme. They didn't think they took long all the term. Risks. So they everything was a short term. Yeah. When you like, don't care if you reward. die, if you're not risking your future, right. then because you'll do anything. You'll take every jump. You'll take every leap of faith because you're not trying to protect any long term. Yeah. But that just made like they were literally a flash in the pan. It's just so backwards because it's like they knew it the whole time, yet they caused it. It was that self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. But they would not have accomplished all that they did if I they, know. If they, if held they were holding. If yeah. they were trying to protect a healthy, balanced life where I can have grandkids. Yeah. So it's like, what? Like, are we backwards? You know, is what's healthy. Not quality or quantity. Healthy. Yeah. They went for quality. But not really because but they, they weren't did. fully rooted. Because who cares what they thought? The ends justified the means, you know? Their yeah. impact justified their. That's true. This has just been mind blowing for me, just helping me understand what the lack of depth and commitment and like what it's attributed to. Yes. I'm like, is this from trauma? Is this from your childhood? And the lack of engaging fully. It's like they engaged fully. They didn't rest fully. They didn't sink into things. They didn't plant roots. And I'm I was trying to figure out, like, what is wrong with these people? But. This helps me get it so yeah. much better. And I think I, that we'll just keep unpacking oh that. Oh my gosh, yeah. And it, I, I'm always going back to what is actually right. Like, Because I am all about takeaways and applying it to my life. Like, What can I learn here? And so I'm always trying to figure out because my Enneagram is a one and I want to know what's righteous and what's <laughs> just and what actually should be. And you go to a seven. In health. Yeah. So I'm always trying to figure out what is the better way to live, like actually, not selfishly, actually what is the better right. way. And then, what, what gives the best result or production? Uh-huh. And that's a lot to think about. Bethany's going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I wonder time too. A seven is probably future oriented. Or present. Yeah, or present. I bet you they're present. You keep reading. Because a one up. is present. I know that. Yeah. Okay, back to the positives of a seven. They are endowed with abundant vitality and a desire to fully participate in their lives each day. They're naturally cheerful and good humored, not taking themselves too seriously or anything else for that matter. And that was kick for you yeah. talking to Lem being like, these people do not freaking know how to laugh. As we have seen, the basic desire of sevens is to be satisfied, happy, and fulfilled. And when they are balanced within themselves, their joy and enthusiasm for life naturally affect everyone around them, which I don't know if they were balanced, but definitely their joy and enthusiasm for life affected literally everyone. When I was around, every time I'm around Jack, life speeded up. Yep. When you're with the Kennedys, life is just better. When you're like, there's nothing quite like being around the Kennedys. If I could give an arm, a leg, or any really remaining limb to be one of them, I freaking would have. Yeah, I... What, from what I'm seeing, they live in the future. They, they're future oriented. Called it. Because you wouldn't be so in your head if you're that present. That's true. Like my you're brain right. doesn't exist half the time because I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> acting on what's happening at the moment. But maybe all of the gut, I wonder if that correlates. Oh, yeah. All the, the thinkers gut. are all future because dad. Oh, no, no. Dad's a future oriented. And he's in the heart triad. Okay. Wow. So they don't correlate. That's interesting. Let me see. Any okay, I've saved on this is so nerdy. Enneagram but. types, present, future, and thinking orientations. Maybe past orientation, not thinking. Oh my gosh, sorry. Because <laughs> like, what I'm lacking past is and what future. What I'm lacking is thinking. Okay, but also side note why Cassie's looking something up. You can also at the very, very bottom of each type description, you can look at the levels of development and there's healthy levels, average levels and unhealthy levels. And that's also fascinating because you can obviously like move up and down. This is wrong. I oh, know this is not wrong. Listen to this, Beth. Past time orientations are fours, fives and nines. Hold on. Constantly Whoa, on a I loop already knew of nine. regret. I already knew that. that. So me, four, Mac. Four, fives and nines. Me, Mac, Audrey. I knew fives and, were. Or fours were. Me, Mac, Audrey and mom all passed. Okay. Y'all are the most miserable. You're the only <laughs> present and dad's the only future. So all like most of our family is just like stuck in the past. That's so weird though, because I feel like we're not. No. Like as a family. So y'all are pretty healthy. 
for a four, you're super healthy. <laughs> for being for the, the most unhealthy. <laughs> for being the sickest, <laughs> you're pretty freaking healthy. What? That's so horrible of me to think that y'all is the worst one, but like, it no, actually it actually is. Like hell. Yeah. The, I feel like it's the most selfish. The no. present time orientations. But then he, it literally says in the description. Because, but, but you, you're, but listen to it, this. you and health are like the least selfish. So that's not true. How is that? That's not true. You go to a one in health. Okay, well, that's true. Literally the uh, description is the sensitive withdrawn type, expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed, and temperamental. In temperamental. Self-absorbed. Yours says (laughs) self-controlled. That you should be proud of yourself. None, Bethany, none of the other ones, none of the other ones. The challenger is self-confident. The peacemaker is self-effacing. No one else is self-absorbed. So that's our freaking basis for kick. We are going to use that as our filter for all of the events that unfold next episode. And I don't think that she was just this cold, cold, brat of a person. I think she was a lost girl. Join us here next week to hear all about the only true Kennedy rebel. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share blood and business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business.